Hi, and welcome to According to Pete for mid-September-ish, sort of, kind of. Um, today, uh, we are going to cover the next thing on the list of technology that I tend to take for granted, which is Bluetooth. Specifically, we're going to talk about Bluetooth Classic. Um, now, this we, we, in a future vid, uh, video, we're going to cover uh, BLE, Bluetooth Low Energy, uh, or Bluetooth Smart, if you're of that ilk. But uh, today we're going to cover Bluetooth Classic from a sort of lower level perspective to give you an idea of what's going on. And uh, by the end of the video, I hope, I hope that you've got enough information to uh, be able to hold your own in a conversation with a lot of Bluetooth nerds. You probably won't. Maybe you will. I don't know. But be careful what you say. Don't put your foot in your mouth. I hope I help a little bit. Um, now let's hit it. So going into this today, I should say that um, the reason I decided to split this up between Bluetooth Classic and Bluetooth Low Energy is because the two things are very different. Uh, at one time, I actually thought I could do a single video that would describe both of these things. It's not possible. I mean, maybe it's possible if you make it a really, really long video, but it'd be really convoluted and really stupid in the end. So. Um, the, the two things are, are not compatible, not at all. So uh, we're going to talk about classic today. We'll get to Bluetooth low energy in, in an, uh, <laughs> Bluetooth low energy in another video. Um, and as I go through this, I will start to draw the similarities and the differences out for you. And by the end of the second video, it should be very clear. We hope it will be very clear. Uh, but first, let's do some uh, uh, history. History. Where did Bluetooth come from? Well, okay, uh, start with the name. Uh, it was named for this dude, Harold Bluetooth Blathand Gormson. Son of Gorm. I want to be Gorm's son. Um, he was the second king of Denmark uh, from 940 to 981 AD, and the story goes something like um, he united the tribes of Denmark and I. Finland? No. Norway? I forget. It's another country up there. Um, everybody watching from the nose comes here is going to be like, oh, Pete, this is unacceptable. Um, but the gist of this is he was a uniting entity of that time. And this was, um, so, uh, well, we'll get to the next thing. But um, the idea behind him is that uh, everybody works together and everything works together. And that was sort of the philosophy behind Bluetooth uh, when it didn't have the name Bluetooth as a technology. One standard that everybody can get behind. Anyway, um, Harold doesn't really have that much to do with this video. In fact, we can stop talking about him now. Uh, I read about him. It's an interesting story. Check out his wiki page if you want to know some more. So Bluetooth is... Um, Designed to be short range, low power, low data rate. And this is in comparison to like Wi-Fi, okay? Uh, we'll talk about data rates in a bit. Uh, it was created in the, not early 80s, but er, well, late 80s, early 90s. That's how that's supposed to read. Uh, by Ericsson Mobile in their effort to create uh, a wireless headset or a wireless serial link, right? That was their pursuit. Um, and it used to be, used to be uh, IEEE. IEEE managed... Um, the uh, standard once upon a time, and it was 802.15.1. They don't manage the standard anymore. Who manages it now is the Bluetooth Special Interest Group, SIG. Maybe they call it SIG. I don't know. I've never heard anybody say Bluetooth SIG, but Bluetooth SIG! And they are, uh, according to their Wikipedia page, uh, a group of 30,000 plus companies represented, okay? And of those companies, you have promoter members, you have associate members, right? For some amount of money, you get to be one of these members. Uh, adopter members, and then universities. And you see I've quoted all of these, and I didn't quote the universities because we expect universities to be real, but maybe they're not. Maybe they're not, man. Uh, okay, uh, forget that. Uh, Promoter, uh, the core companies, right? The ones that were uh, originally on board, the, 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 the core companies, right? Uh, Ericsson, Intel, Nokia, Toshiba, and IBM. They were all like some of, the, some of the beginners, the ones that were there. In the beginning, man, the original gangsters, man. And uh, uh, some of the later core members, uh, Microsoft came on in 1999. Lenovo came on in 2005. And then Apple, 2015, they were holding out. I don't know why, probably something to do with money if I had to guess. 
Anyway, um, the Bluetooth Special Interest Group now manages the Bluetooth uh, 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 standard, uh, both classic and BLE. So just to give you a little bit better idea of the history, I'll go through uh, the history of the specs as they have occurred and a few notes about them. Now this is extremely generalized, okay? Uh, this is to save time. If you wanna know more about it, hit the wiki page or there's actually a ton of resources out there for Bluetooth and what's happened and how it works and yada, yada, yada. But it's all kind of convoluted. We'll talk about it as we go. But um, what's happened since the early days uh, we have 1.0 and 1.0b where they're working out the interoperability. 1.1, uh, which ended up being 802.15.1-2002, uh, back when uh, IEEE was still managing the spec, where they implemented RSSI and they fixed a bunch of stuff, I guess. Uh, 1.2 was 802.15.1.2005, and that's the last entry I have for IEEE. So after that, uh, the Special Interest Group took over. Uh, they adopted adaptive uh, frequency hopping spread spectrum. They could get up to 721 kilobi kilobits per second, not bytes. Uh, implemented a host controller interface. And there was 2.0 plus EDR in 2004, and I apologize if this is too small for you to read. A lot of the reason for those notes is so I can remember what I'm supposed to say, so everybody be cool about it. Uh, 2004, uh, EDR, extended data rate. Um, they could get it up to 2.1 megabits per second using uh, Gaussian uh, frequency shift keying and phase shift keying, and they have a di couple of different versions of phase shift keying that we will talk about in a little bit. Um, ah, take a breath, Pete. 2.1 plus EDR in 2007, where they implemented secure simple pairing. 3.0 plus HS in 2009. This is very interesting. You probably, at least some of you will know about this. Uh, back uh, in the day, in the day, how many times am I going to say that? 2009. Uh, high speed, they implemented Wi-Fi on the same chip, right? So if you needed to get like a really high data rate, you could switch over to Wi-Fi and you could get 25 megabit per second, which is pretty cool. Then in 2010, there's 4.0 plus LE. That's BLE for uh, all y'all. Um, there were a lot of manufacturers trying to figure out how they're going to implement these two different, very different things. Uh, and you had some that made single mode, which is either classic or low energy, or Bluetooth smart. Um, uh, and there's some that would do both modes. Uh, they also implemented the uh, generic attribute profile, which presumably is in BLE, because I don't remember that in the classic stack. And we'll talk about that as we go farther down. Uh, in 2013, there was 4.1. It was a bunch of software updates. I didn't see anything significant in that. Uh, 4.2 was in 2014, uh, where the special interest group got wise to IoT. There's lots of money to be made in IoT, man. So they started uh, switching gears to sell Bluetooth Low Energy uh, as the poster child for BLE uh, or, or IoT. Um, they also support, started supporting uh, IPv6 over IPv4, and in 2016 was Bluetooth 5, where the special interest group dropped the dot thing. Now it's just five, uh, and now they can do 50 megabit per second, greater range, higher power, yada, yada, yada. So that's a little bit of the history of how the spec has run. So let me illustrate uh, for you a little bit some of the differences between classic Bluetooth and BLE, Bluetooth Low Energy. Um, in general, generally speaking, uh, classic is high data rate and higher power where low energy is low data rate and low power. In general. Uh, classic ends up being long range, uh, low energy is low range obviously, lower power, da 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 da, lower data rate. The big, the big thing, the big thing seems to be this, audio streaming. Classic can do audio streaming. Bluetooth Low Energy cannot do audio streaming, yet. Um, we'll talk about that in a sec. Uh, as, as described here, um, Classic has four different power levels. 
Uh, class 4, half a milliwatt. Class 3, one milliwatt. Class 2, two and a half milliwatts. And class 1, 100 milliwatts of raw power. And uh, low energy is 10 milliwatts max. Bluetooth low energy can't do audio. So when, when there's an audio application, classic is the go-to still. But um, as a casual observer from the outside, which I am, um, these are two different standards, right? And that's obvious by now. But the, the use cases for both of these things, when you list them all out, they're strikingly similar. And as time goes on, BLE gets faster, it gets higher power, it gets better range. And if I were part of the Bluetooth special interest group, I would say, you know what? Screw this dual thing. Let's just make one standard and increase it. But the audio market for Bluetooth Classic is pretty big. And I don't know how they're going to unseat that, but I would imagine that they're going to attempt to after a given period of time because uh, they, they, this gets closer to this as time goes on, it seems. Uh, are they planning to get, go do away with Classic? I don't know. It's still the go-to for high data rate and high power uh, or audio, but uh, only time will tell. So. Uh, to talk a little bit about the uh, low-level stuff, um, Bluetooth Classic and BLE, yada yada, uh, operates in the 2.4 gigahertz ISM band. ISM is industrial, scientific, and medical, uh, which these applications could benefit from Bluetooth. So what the heck, they're there. Um, from 2.4 oh, 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 up to 2.4835 gigahertz, uh, there's a 2 megahertz guard band at the low end of this and a 3.5 megahertz guard band at the top of this. That's the sort of kind of keep noise out. I don't know why they do that. There's so much noise in the band anyway, why bother? But um, there are 79 channels. Uh, this space is divided into 79 channels, including those two guard bands. The channels are spaced at 1 megahertz. Uh, and it starts at 2.400, oh, oh, sorry, 2.402? Two megahertz. Uh, somebody correct me if I get that wrong. Um, and uh, the channel numbers go up per one megahertz. So one up, up to 2.4833. Three. Um, the uh, modulation schemes used are Gaussian frequency shift keying that gets you one megabit per second. Pi over four DQPSK. DQPSK stands for uh, differential quadrature phase shift keying. Uh, that gets you up to 2.4 megabits, uh, not 2.4, 2 megabits per second. And 8 DPSK, which is just differential phase shift keying, gets you to 3 megabit per second. I am not going to spend any time talking about these modulation schemes. Check them out on Wikipedia or your other favorite um, modulation reference on the internet if you want more information. Or put a comment in the comment section and say, Pete, we just really want you to cover DPSK and pi over 4 DQP. Okay, we're moving on. Uh, and there's also HS, which we talked about very briefly uh, when we had that giant list of junk that they had done over the years. And of course, HS stands for high speed, man. And that is effectively Wi-Fi, right? It's a 2.4 gigahertz radio. Stands to reason they can do this, um, and that will get you up to 25 megabits per second. And we'll move on from there. So the general topology of um, a Bluetooth connection thing, um, let's just, just listen, just listen. Uh, it's a master-slave sort of thing, right? You've got one master and you've got up to seven slaves, and those things together are what constitute a PicoNet. Pico -net. Um, and then you can have these parked slaves too. And we'll talk about that uh, in a little bit, which is parked slave is like, they're in standby, not standby, they're in kind of sleep mode. And it's kind of like, uh, look, you can be part of the club, but sit down and shut up and don't make any noise. Uh, that's kind of what parked slaves means to me. And then uh, something I did not write down here is that you can have Pico nets that are sort of loosely associated with each other, but I haven't quite wrapped my head around all of that. Honestly, in all of my Bluetooth shenanigans, I mean, most of it is from my phone to my car, or if I'm doing a project, it's point to point, right? And so I don't have any real experience firsthand with a PicoNet. I've never tried to set one up. I don't know if they do this behind my back, but it's a topology, it does exist, and you should know about it. All right, now this is where it starts to get cool. Uh, the uh, 
Bluetooth uses frequency hopping spread spectrum, right? Uh, and what it does is it hops around frequencies, 600, 600, 1600 hops per second, which is pretty cool, I think pretty cool. Uh, it does this in a pseudo random sequence, which is actually seeded by the master's MAC address, which is also cool. And the timing, oh, incidentally, this is where I got wise to my marker sucking really bad, so I got a new marker. Um, the timing of these hops is determined by the master's clock. Now, this is, of course, all of this hopping around business is done in an effort to avoid noise, right? Because the ISM band is basically a free for all. And, um, and, and it's an, this is an adaptive system, right? And apparently you can turn this particular function off. I don't know why you would want to do this, but uh, the adaptive portion of this can figure out which of the channels uh, are particularly noisy and eliminate them from the hopping sequence. Um, so it's an adaptive system and that's pretty cool. Bluetooth uses, uh, and I, I feel like I want to keep saying classic just so we don't get anybody confused along the road here. I am talking specifically classic but BLE shares a lot of this stuff. But we're not talking about BLE. Okay, just say that, okay. Um, Bluetooth Classic uses time domain, for some reason I got the blue one back in my hand, time domain multiplexing, TDM. So what that means is that um, the master device sets up time slots where things happen, okay? And it splits them up, each time slot is 625 microseconds. And the way this shakes out, is that in an existing PicoNet, right, PicoNet, um, the master will transmit to one of the slaves in the PicoNet and say, hey, what do you got for me, man? And then the slave will come back and say, I got this for you. And it transmits this back in one time slot. And then it goes uh, round robin fashion to the next one. Hey, what do you got? Well, I got this junk. And it only takes one time slot. But they don't just do one time slot. You can also have a slave reply in one or three or five time slots, depending on how much data it needs to get through. Um, we'll talk about that in a sec. Uh, but S3 here is my example of three going back up to the master. Um, now, each one of these time slots represents a new frequency hop. Okay, so every time this happens, that's a new frequency that the, the network is jumping to, to yada, yada, yada. We'll talk about the connection sequence in a bit. As we're discussing uh, uh, the time slots and such, uh, I should mention there are two different kinds of connection that we're looking at here. Uh, one is termed SCO, synchronous connection oriented, and ACL, asynchronous connection less. Um, now in a nutshell, in a nutshell, and I'm gonna say in a nutshell because uh, semantically there are some nuances between these two definitions that are completely lost on me, um, but an SCO connection is basically an audio link and they are the ones that only take one time slot. Now the way I've gotten this drawn, I don't know that you would have a PicoNet that has multiple audio channels active. So, I mean, as far as I know, in my car, I've got one active at any given time. But in any case, these would represent the synchronous uh, connection less, the SCO connection, and the, uh, the other one, ACL, asynchronous connection less. Um, <laughs> say SCO is synchronous connection oriented. I can't keep these straight. You see how, how this is? Um, but the ACL connections are primarily for data. And data, or anything, anything that takes more than one time slot to return, that's what they're calling ACL. So we're going to go with that. All right, the generic form of uh, uh, the data format of uh, what transpires between a master and a slave looks like this. It's very generic. Uh, you have, and this is, this is in an existing PicoNet, right? So the, this is assuming connection has already been made. Um, a packet looks like this. You've got 72 bits at the beginning that are an access code, 54 bits in the middle that are the header, and then the payload, which is anything from zero to 2745 bits. And this all happens within the uh, 625 microsecond thing, okay? So of that generic form, the first section, the access code, is made up of a four bit preamble, um, a 64 bit synchronization uh, thing, and then a four bit trailer at the end of that. And the synchronization is actually derived from the master's ID. 
and if I remember correctly, it's actually repeated three times? I'm having a hard time remembering that bit. I didn't write that note down, but I think that one's repeated. It's derived from the master's ID, and then that sequence is repeated a few times. Um, but that's the access code portion. So the next section is the packet header section. Now, that breaks down like this. You've got uh, the, the <laughs> active member address that takes up three bits, and this is um, like three bits because, right, you've got one master and seven slaves. Three bits, seven, get it? So that's who we're talking to. Uh, the type of packet is indicated here, and that's four bits, and there are 12 types of uh, data packets and uh, there are four control packets, four types of control packets. Uh, and these 12 uh, different kinds of data packets are for both uh, ACL and SCO types of exchanges. Um, then you've got flow control, one bit, uh, ARQN, which is basically an acknowledge bit, and then you've got a sequence bit, one bit to determine the sequence. Is this one next? Is that one next? It's nuts. Um, and then you've got the HEC, the header error check. So basically a CRC sort of thing. Um, and that's the packet header section. And the last section, of course, is the data section, um, which is 0 to 2744 bits. I think in one of the previous sections here, I said it was 2745. Uh, I don't think it can be 45, that's an odd number, and this divides down to like 343, I think, bytes. Uh, so I think it's 2744, and I just gave you that number wrong. So, um, not much to say about the data section, in spite of me continuously talking. Uh, it's basically all data, uh, that much data, uh, or uh, two times that if you're using uh, pi over 4 dqpsk, or three times that if you're using uh, 8 dpsk, um, or more if you're using audio, yada, yada, yada. It's the data section. Okay, we're going to move on from there. Okay, now I want to talk about the connection sequence. But I've had to cram an awful lot of junk on the board to try to keep everything straight because it's a very convoluted sort of in my opinion, convoluted sort of uh, thing. So um, in order to describe this, first I'm gonna talk about the state machine that Bluetooth is during the connection sequence. Um, there are basically two states that it can exist in, uh, two primary states. One is standby and the other is connected. And between those two, you have a number of other things. You have page and master response, page scan and slave response, inquiry and inquiry scan and inquiry response that give you various roads to get between connected and standby. And I'll illustrate some of that as we go through the connection sequence, which is on the other side of this. Then there are these other little notes here. I doubt you can read them. If you can, you've got really good eyes, man. Um, but these are mostly for me to remember how all of this goes. So try to bear with me. So with all of that in mind, let me try to describe what the connection sequence looks like. Now these are two devices that have not been talking. They don't know each other. We don't know each other, do we? No, we don't know each other. Um, now the first thing that has to happen is your potential slave, right, the one that you're going to try to talk to, uh, it has to be put into discoverable mode. Now if you're working from your phone or other high-level device, uh, that is that entails turning on the device or making it discoverable, right? Um, if you're talking to an embedded device, you would give it a direct command through its HCI, host co uh, controller interface, uh, to be discoverable. And what that means is if it gets an inquiry from a master or a device that wants to connect, it will answer back and say, yes, I'm here, yada, yada. Um, so that's what we're talking about. Now, what's it listening to? Well, you remember, those 79 frequency channels, <laughs> frequency channels, um, 32 of them have been designated as inquiry channels, okay? And what happens is when the slave device is in discoverable mode, it will listen to each one of those 32 channels for 11.25 milliseconds at least once every 2.56 seconds. And there's like one overlapping channel whatever. Um, now, the master device, the one that's going to try to connect, it separates those 32 inquiry frequencies into 16 frequency 
trains. I don't know why they call it a train. I, a pulse train? Data train? I don't know. Um, so anyway, what it will do is it will cycle through those two frequency trains and it will send out uh, ID packets. And those ID packets include what is called the General Inquiry Access Code, GAC. And there's another acronym for it that's like a company or something online that's kind of wacky. Um, but we're not talking about that one. Um, now, the General Inquiry Access Code, the hopping sequence through the, the inquiry frequencies, through, through the um, um, 16 frequency trains, right? That hopping sequence is uh, derived from the general inquiry access code, okay? And the master, when it sends out these ID packets, it will do so, it'll run through each of these frequency trains 256 times, okay? So it's a whole bunch of times. And there's some overlap, obviously, between this guy, maybe not obvious, there's some overlap, right? So the, the odds of a connection or odds of a slave device hearing this are pretty decent. Nonetheless, sometimes they still miss. Um, but when the slave hears the device, and I apologize if this seems loose, it is loose. My understanding of this is loose and I'm trying to help you help me. Um, but when the slave device hears it, what it will do uh, and I've read this like a hundred times in a hundred different papers, it will back off. I'm not sure what back off means in this context. I think it means it will just stop doing anything for a little bit uh, and then it will pipe up and it will send an inquiry response that includes its FHS, which is frequency hopping sequence. Um, and that includes uh, its own ID and its own clock. And assuming the master picks this up, it goes to page mode, page mode. Um, okay, so let me back up just a sec. The slave does not go into page mode. The slave goes into page scan mode because it's scanning, right? The master goes into page mode. And so when it's in page mode, it will address the slave device um, on a new hopping sequence, right? Which is derived from the, uh, the ID of the slave, right? So now they're on a new, a, a new hopping sequence and, uh, and, and the master is like, hey, hey slave, okay, now we're gonna get serious about this connection business. So it pages out and then the, the slave answers back um, with another device access code and uh, now it's getting more serious and the master responds with uh, its frequency hopping sequence, right? So now we're into a third frequency hopping sequence, which is based on the master's ID and the master's clock, okay? And then uh, the last thing to happen is you get one more response from the slave uh, with its own local device access code, after which it switches to the master's hopping sequence uh, and let the data flow and then everything's great. Okay, maybe not everything's great, but that's how it goes. Now, uh, I should mention that for a slave in connected state, there are um, four modes of function. One is active mode, where everything's happening. It's a, it's a, a, a pay, dues-paying member of the Pico net, where it's exchanging data constantly. Um, then there is sniff mode. I'll let you make of that what you will. Um, effectively, it's listening to a reduced number of time slots. Okay, remember? Time division multipli uh, multiplication. Time division multiplying, uh, multiplexing. So it's only listening to certain time slots. Then there's hold mode, where it will not do ACL. It'll do SCO, and SCO being the audio. So apparently it'll still do audio in hold mode, and it has a, a reduced power setting. Uh, then there is parked mode, and I'm not sure how many parked devices can be on a Pico Net, but it's a bunch. Um, and basically that's just, you know, sit down and shut up. Don't make any, you can be in the PicoNet in name only, but you're not a contributing member. Um, and those are the four modes that you should be aware of. Now let's talk about profiles, right? And if you've ever had anything to do with Bluetooth, you know about profiles. Well, a profile, and if you, if you don't, this is what we're done. Um, a profile basically defines attributes, services, 
formats, etc. It, it basically defines how you talk to the Bluetooth radio at a high level and what sort of service and performance you can expect to get out of it as a result. Now, there are literally dozens of different profiles. And if you were just like a Bluetooth user, you're probably not even gonna know very much about it because uh, your devices are gonna figure out what their profiles are and accommodate that. If you're a developer, you might have to choose a profile that you work with. Um, now, being that there are so many, so many profiles and more get adopted every year, um, it seems really versatile, right? But in my head somehow, I've got it like, it's a finite list somehow that's not as versatile. And I'm sure this is my own ignorance uh, of the subject that is talking here. Um, but the only profile I've got any real firsthand experience with as uh, a guy who tinkers with low level point to point things uh, is serial port protocol, right? Uh, remember the beginning when I said Ericsson was trying to make a wireless serial link? Well, there's a profile for that. Um, and this is where I spend most of my time uh, because you just put data in and you get data out and it's a two-way link and it works really snazzy. Okay, let's talk about the Bluetooth stack. This is a generalized form of the stack uh, and I'll address this, I'll, I'll address that at the end. Um, but there are a lot of different versions that you can see this in. Um, now, in my representation, <laughs> at the top we've got the application layer followed by uh, some individual protocols. And I have to address my notebook for this because I can't keep them straight. Um, what we've got is the telephony control protocol specification, the object exchange, uh, wireless application protocol, and service discovery protocol. Now, there are bunches of other protocols that could be up here, right? Um, these are followed by RFCOM and then the logical link control and adaptation protocol, uh, affectionately known as L2CAP. Um, now, let me explain some of this. There's some gray area, or I've perceived a bunch of gray area between the application layer and the protocols because profiles are said to live in the application layer, but profiles tend to determine and define protocols. So there's kind of this mushy gray area between the application and the individual pro protocols. And it could be argued that those two get merged. And in some representations of Bluetooth stacks, I think they are merged. So, but that's, that's how I've spelled this out. So to clarify, uh, RFCOM is effectively a serial link, okay? And the logical link control and adaptation protocol, L2CAP, uh, what it does is um, it takes in uh, the data from each of these protocols and churns it around and regurgitates it in such fashion that the host controller can interpret it. Now, I'll point out at this point, I'm not sure if this actually flows from my notes, I'm, I'm gonna wing it, I'm gonna wing it, man. But um, I've got these two sections paired off, if you see by the dotted dry erase marks. And the reason for that is that you've got the host stack and then you've got the controller stack. And we haven't talked about this, we'll talk about this in a sec. But basically, this is chip level stuff, right? Everything from the host controller down is chip level, it happens on the device itself. Uh, everything that happens above that from L2 cap up happens on your host device, your computer, the higher levels of your phone, anything that is not on the actual Bluetooth chip, right? Um, and when I say that it's always that way, I mean generally, sometimes, most of the time. Doesn't have to be though, okay? There's a lot of gray area here. I did say this was convoluted, right? It's very convoluted. So uh, L2 cap layer also, it's, uh, it tells the radio what, what data to send and when. Uh, it also reassembles packets as they, as they are received. So it has a lot to do with what happens lower. That's probably obvious. Now, chip level, what you have is host controller interface. Um, and this is basically, if you've ever worked with any of the, uh, any of the Bluetooth chips, like through a serial link, and I don't mean over the air, I'm being stupid. Um, if you talk to it over a terminal program, you're gonna be issuing it commands, like AT commands, that sort of thing. 
um, and this is what you're talking to. You're talking to the host controller interface. Below that, the link manager protocol, baseband link controller, and the actual radio itself. This is bare metal that we're talking about, and each one of these layers will put in its own control bits to make sure that data goes from here to there. Okay. To wrap up our very brief description of a generic Bluetooth stack, let me say that the reason there are so many different representations of that shtick on the internet is because there isn't just one, there's bunches of them uh, written by different entities, okay? And there's, uh, there's not just one way that you could do it. Um, and different entities will write the host stack and different entities will write the controller stack. And so that's why this boundary layer is here. So the, this is genericized and this is genericized so they can talk to each other. So you've got various stacks that are unrelated. They can still talk to each other. So this is why if you go looking for this information or if you're a hardcore Bluetooth person and you know all of this like the back of your hand and I have missed your favorite protocol or, or <laughs> layer, they are not represented in this diagram. I sincerely apologize. Uh, throw something down in the comments uh, and we can talk about it some more. But this is, this is my generic representation of how this uh, looks. In fact, that's where we're going to wrap today. Um, now we've covered an awful lot of stuff about uh, Bluetooth Classic uh, from a low level perspective, uh, but there's tons more, tons more. Um, I recognize that I have paraphrased and generalized a lot of this to the point where you may have more questions than you have answers. So um, if you do, if you're in that state, don't hesitate to put a question in the comment section where it will be answered either by myself or someone who knows the topic better than I do because those people do come around from time to time. Um, but you should also do your own research. There is more information on Bluetooth out there on the internet than you can possibly imagine. And when you do this, I would highly recommend that you read multiple sources about the same information because it ain't all the same from one to one. And to get a really good idea of what Bluetooth is and what you're looking at, you're gonna have to read it over and over and over and read it from a bunch of different sources because they all tend to say slightly different things, okay? So I hope this was entertaining, if not informative. <laughs> I'm shooting for both. Um, and until next time, thank you so much for hanging out. And uh, again, if you have any comments or suggestions or questions, put them in the comment section below and someone, someone will answer them, maybe not me. but. Until next time, thanks for hanging. Bye.